Hey guys, it's me again, and you know, I have not even taken the time to welcome all of you new subscribers. Welcome to my channel. I know that these Calvinism videos have brought a whole bunch of new subscribers, which I didn't even notice, so sorry. I, for any of you that have been with me for a long time, you know, you know that stuff is just like not even on my radar. But when I saw how many new subscribers I have, I got so excited. I can't believe how many people have come to my channel to hear my story and are interested in hearing my story. I really hope that my story encourages just normal people like me. You know, I don't have a PhD. I, I'm a college dropout, for goodness sake. I don't have any sort of special education, yet I still have the Holy Spirit. I have the scriptures. They are my authority. The Lord says, seek and you will find. And so I hope that it's encouraging to you that you do not have to feel like you cannot search the word for yourself and you have to rely on others' interpretation of it. So that's what i've seen that a lot of people have been encouraged by and i cannot tell you how amazing it has been to hear some of your stories i wish i could meet every single one of you that have been in some way affected by calvinism face to face so i can just ask you a million questions because it is fascinating how it affects everybody so differently and then as you heal and move on with your life looking back you can see even more things that it affected you in ways you were not aware of they just start to pop up here and there and it's just overwhelming so i have really appreciated you guys sharing your stories in the comments i'm so sorry that i haven't been able to comment on everybody's comment there's so many people which i'm so excited about but obviously i am homeschooling i have a house to run meals to prepare animals to take care of and my family to pay attention to so i really cannot be on my phone checking comments and typing is probably my least favorite form of communication i love talking uh i love boxer and facebook messenger and things like that where i can leave voice messages and know that you'll get them eventually and then you can leave a reply and know that i'll get it eventually and then we can dialogue that way there have been a few of you that have reached out to me and we've gotten to discuss some things which has been wonderful as well i'm very thankful just to see how god's using these videos i um started my channel maybe 12 years ago this December. I always forget the year. I think Joelle was already one. I, I can never remember. I, I'm always off by a year or two. I prayed when I first started my channel. The reason I started it is because I had so much to say. I had so much I wanted to encourage young mothers and young wives with, and I didn't feel like that anybody wanted to listen. So I started a channel and I didn't even I don't even know if the thought of a subscriber ever entered my mind and then when I started getting subscribers I was like oh cool okay there's like a desire for this that's great and then I just was in my channel evolved from like me sitting in front of the computer um, talking about whatever topic during the baby's nap time to me using my phone walking around living my life because now I had toddlers running around to you know different different things that came into my life that were important at the time i had business stuff going on for a while i had gardening stuff going on for a while now we've been living in the country for two years so of course i'm making videos about gardening and chickens and i've always done cooking videos uh but i'm really into herbal medicine now so you just get to like live life with me and come along with me on all the new interests that pop into my life i will say the last three years have been very hard to make videos because all I wanted to talk about was Calvinism for the last two and a half, th almost three years. This November is three years. And so it has probably been the years that I've done the least amount of videos, very spaced out, because all I wanted to talk about was Calvinism. And I know that some of you caught some live videos that I would sneak in some information, but then I would eventually delete the videos. And um, so you kind of knew what was going on, but obviously you didn't hear the full story till two weeks ago. And so because this is like the big, huge thing in my life for the last three years, it has been hard to not talk about it. And it's been hard to want to talk about other stuff. Long intro just to welcome you new, you new subscribers and to thank you for subscribing and thank you for your support and your encouragement. The comments have been overwhelmingly positive and I'm so thankful because 
I mean, obviously as a YouTuber, you deal with all sorts of ugly comments, but I haven't had really harsh, unkind comments for years. I mean, in the beginning, oh my word, I used to get some crazy comments and I thought, wow, this is not for the weak of heart. <laughs> like, you have got to be thick skinned to be a YouTuber. People say some insane things to you. And then every now and then now I'll get a mean comment, but most of the time it's my people that are with me, that are watching my videos because that's what they want to hear about. And they're so encouraging and you all, I mean, I love my subscribers. So I'm very thankful to see what God's done with my channel and what he's continuing to do and excited to see how he's going to use it in the future. Um, I definitely, uh, I'm happy that I get to speak more openly now about Calvinism for a very long time. I was scared to, like if I was doing something wrong, which now in hindsight I realize, no, I wasn't. But I do think that there's this, um, a lot of influencing voices. You'd never know what to uh, listen to. And after a while you realize whatever the Lord is saying. <laughs> because obviously the people that were Calvinists we're saying this is unwise, this is not helpful, why do you care so much? Uh, in heaven, this isn't gonna matter. And then you hear the other side saying, the Lord sent you into my life, he's used you so mightily in my life, thank you so much for talking about this, please keep talking about this. And then I feel me, and I'm like, this is a huge deal, this matters, even though, yeah, in heaven we won't care. I do believe that what happens between now and heaven is gonna impact heaven and so these things matter and they have to be known about and discussed and so I want to be allowed to talk about it but Lord am I being unwise or am I being this or am I being that and just searching my heart and then finally coming to the point where it was like I want to talk about this I feel pure in my motives I feel clear conscience before you Lord people are being blessed I see this as an actual real issue in the church so I'm gonna talk about it. And I have my husband's blessing and I have close friends that hold me accountable, their blessing as well. Oh my goodness, like green light, you know, green light. I am gonna talk today about, probably a lot about unconditional election, limited atonement, the scriptures that I used to hold to for unconditional election and how I see them today. And then limited atonement, um, honestly, probably an ignored letter in Tulip for me. I know that I did not, uh, I believed in it, right? I knew that I believed in it. I knew what it meant. I knew the verses that didn't really mean world and didn't really mean all. I knew that, I knew the arguments for it. I knew the John Owen method. Well, if God died for everybody, then everybody would be saved. I knew all that, but obviously I never looked at all the scriptures stacked uh, that clearly says world, whole world, everyone, every man, all people, whosoever, all, 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 and really thought for a minute, like, oh, wait a minute, like, we're seriously disregarding all these passages. I definitely held to Perseverance of the Saints, but I do think that Perseverance of the Saints is a very misunderstood part of Calvinism. Most people equate it with eternal security and it's different than that. And it, I, I have to admit, like there is so much subtlety to some of these things that it takes a long time to understand it well enough to decide whether you agree with it or not, or to see the gravity of it or not. It took me probably a year and a half to realize how absolutely terrifying to hold to limited atonement is. It, I didn't realize how heavy of a situation you are putting yourself in if you are saying, no, Jesus did not die for the whole world. He only died for the elect. To say that is to deny or to change a lot of scripture. And I didn't realize the weight of that until like a year ago, you know? So I, I'm, I'm on a journey and I'm still on the journey. I'm not done yet and I don't think I've arrived anywhere. So I'm gonna jump right in to Ephesians 1 because of course that's what everybody wants to hear about. And I will say Ephesians 1 and Romans 9, those were my two, like once I realized, okay, I might be wrong here. <laughs> I might be wrong here. I don't know if, I'm, if Calvinism's true. The only way I would have probably moved forward from that, uh, realization was if 
I could be convinced that Ephesians 1 and Romans 9 didn't mean what I thought they meant. If I couldn't have been convinced about Ephesians 1 and Romans 9, then I would have been like, well, then I must just be misunderstanding something, you know? Then, yes, we are elect, and yes, Calvinism is true. So I, I know why everybody's asking about Ephesians 1 and Romans 9. They're used very significantly in the Calvinistic doctrine and I understand that. But now on the other side, obviously I can see where I fell into lots of error. So hopefully I can share how I see it now and it might help you, it might not, and that's fine. I'm not trying to persuade you. I'm just letting you know how I used to see it and how I see it now. So. The first thing I did, I went to Ephesians 1, and I read it by myself, I didn't go anywhere, and the first thing I noticed was all the in Christ, in him, in him, in him, in him. I noticed that it was all over the place, and I started to underline it and highlight it, and I don't know, it just stuck out to me. I didn't do, I didn't know what to do with that, I just knew, wow, it sure says in him quite often. So I did that first, then I kept reading, and in chapter 2, it talks about how we were once dead in our trespasses, we formerly walked according to the course of this world. Then it talks in chapter 2, verse, remember that you were at that time separate from Christ. And that stuck out to me. Because if we're in Christ before the foundation of the world, then we're born separate from Christ, excluded from the commonwealth of Israel, strangers to the covenants of promise, having no hope without God in the world, aliens, right? I just don't see how that, that started to make like, why haven't I ever thought about this before? Why haven't I ever asked this before? What does it mean to be chosen before the foundation of the world? Here I am before the foundation of the world. I don't exist and I'm chosen. Okay. Then I'm born and I'm not in Christ anymore because it says in Ephesians 1 verse 4, just as he chose you in him before the foundation of the world. So here I am chosen in him and then I'm and I'm out of him. I'm separate. I'm a stranger, excluded, walking in your whatever deadness. And then I did watch Kevin Thompson and he brought to my attention in 1 Corinthians when it says if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation, right? The old is gone, the new has come. So if you're in him before the foundation of the world, already that's your status. It's not like the Arminians that you one day will be in him. You already are in him before the foundation of the world. Then how can it also be that whoever's in Christ is a new creation? You're not a new creation here. In fact, you're born and you're separate. So it was all not making much sense. And then I saw that he also brought up chapter two, what I had seen. And it just felt like validation. I'm like, okay, I'm not crazy. I'm not seeing things and way off here. Like he's saying the same thing that I'm saying. But it was still a battle because all I could see was chosen in him, chosen us in him. And the thing with the word chose is I was adding for salvation, okay? It doesn't say for salvation. It doesn't imply for salvation. It's not talking about for salvation. And that's where everything just clicked. We are adding, we are presupposing, we are bringing chose for salvation. Take that little voice out <laughs> and just read the text. It says, starting in verse 3, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. He has blessed us with all the spiritual blessings in the heavenly places in Christ. Okay? So, once you're in Him, the Father has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, in him. Just as, here it starts to list them, list all those blessings. Just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, for what? That we would be holy and blameless for him. You have to ask the question, chose for what? Because up until now, I've been thinking chose for salvation. Doesn't say that. Chose for what? It answers it. Just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we would be holy and blameless before him. So what did he choose us for? That we would be holy and blameless before him. Before the foundation of the world, God decided that whoever is in Christ, right? 
every blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places whoever's in christ in him he chose that whoever is in him would be holy and blameless before him okay and then in love he goes on he predestined us to what to salvation no to adoption as sons through christ jesus how do you get that adoption being a son how through christ jesus how verse 13 after listening to the message of truth the gospel of your salvation having also believed you were sealed so it all boils down to when you believe then you're in christ then chapter one is for you whoever is starting again in verse three blessed be the god and father of our lord jesus christ who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in christ you have to be in christ for these blessings and now here come the blessings just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world that we would be holy and blameless before him that's the first blessing he he planned that whoever is in him will be holy and blameless okay in love he predestined us to adoption as sons through jesus christ according to the kind intention of his will he is so kind the intention of his will is so kind what he predetermined what he predestined was that whoever is in christ will be adopted as sons okay verse six to the praise of the glory of his grace which he freely bestowed on us in the beloved he bestowed this blessing this blessing of becoming a son through jesus through the beloved he bestowed this blessing on us in him we have third blessing redemption through his blood the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of his grace so he just tells us our blessing and then praises god so here praising god again according to the riches of his grace which he lavished on us in all wisdom and insight he made known to us the mystery of his will that mystery he will expound on and elaborate on in chapter three you don't know what that mystery is yet he's talking about it later in chapter three he even says the mystery that i briefly mentioned before he's talking about that mystery in chapter three and the mystery is that well we'll read it after he made known to us the mystery of his will according to his kind intention which he purposed in him so that mystery that reveals his will that he purposed in christ because he's kind with a view to admin to an administration suitable to the fullness of the times that is the summing up of all things in christ things in the heavens and things on the earth okay in him here comes the next blessing also we have obtained an inheritance having been predestined according to his purpose who works all things after the counsel of his will what has been predestined there the inheritance okay not salvation the inheritance for those who are in him also we have obtained an inheritance having been predestined according to his purpose who works all things after the counsel of his will verse 12 to the end that we who are or who were the first to hope in christ would be to the praise of his glory in him again verse 13 this is how you become in him this is how they became in him this is how since they became in christ all these blessings are true for them okay you also after listening to the message of truth the gospel of your salvation having also believed you were sealed in him with the holy spirit of promise who is given us who is given as a pledge of our inheritance so now you receive the holy spirit and now that pre predestined inheritance for those in him that holy spirit is given to us as a pledge of our inheritance with a view to the redemption of god's own possession to the praise of his glory for this reason i too having heard of the faith in the lord jesus which exists among you and your love for all the saints do not cease giving thanks for you okay i'm going to stop with the four so in all those verses not only did he praise god and exalt his wonderful name and his grace and his kindness and how wonderful he is and his plan for us is he let us know the blessings that whoever is in christ has and he let us know how you got in christ how'd you get in christ 
Well, when you heard the message of truth and believed. That's how you got in Christ and now all these wonderful spiritual blessings that come from the Father through the Son are for you and for me. And so he chose to give us these for whoever's in, since before the foundation of the world, he chose these blessings for whoever's gonna be in Christ. He predestined to that he would adopt us and he predestined an inheritance for whoever is in Christ and to give the Holy Spirit to whoever is in Christ as a pledge to that inheritance. I hope you see this, I hope you follow this. Continuing in verse 16. Uh, all the saints do not cease giving thanks for you while making mention of you in my prayers that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the father of glory may give to you a spirit of wisdom and of revelation and the knowledge of him. I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened so that you will know what is the hope of his calling. What are the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints and what is the surpassing greatness of his power toward us who believe these are okay. So there, this is the, the inheritance and the surpassing greatness of his power to us who believe whoever believes is in christ and these are the inheritance and all of these things coming to those who believe and who can believe anybody um these are in accordance with the working of the strength of his might which he brought about in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places, far above all rule and authority and power and dominion and every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the one to come. And he put all things in subjection under his feet and gave him as head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. So he's the head, the church is the body, I believe, especially after reading Romans 11, that anybody can be part of that body because we are grafted in when we believe. And how do you believe? By believing in your heart and confessing with your mouth that Jesus is Lord. And how does faith come? By hearing the word of God. So how beautiful are the feet that carry out the gospel, share the good news. And that good news, when people hear it, they believe Faith comes by hearing that good news and you believe with your heart and you confess with your mouth and whoever calls on the name of the Lord will be saved and will not be put to shame. What do you do with those verses? Do you take them plainly? I do. Um, if you continue reading chapter two, it will show you who we were before we were in Christ because we were not in Christ when we were born. We were not in Christ before the foundation of the world. We were in Christ after you heard the gospel and believed it. Um, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. So who can be in Christ? Well, whoever hears the gospel and believes it. It's not limited to certain people. It's whoever hears the good news and believes it. Um, and then just so you know where that mystery is, uh, expounded on in chapter three, he says, um, in verse three, that by revelation there was made known to me the mystery as i wrote before in brief and then he talks about it and basically it's saying that everyone is welcome through christ to be saved he's saying that um the mystery um has been revealed to his holy apostles and prophets in the spirit to be specific that the gentiles are fellow heirs and fellow members of the body and fellow partakers of the promise in christ jesus through the gospel so Gentiles are now welcome to be partakers and heirs through the promise. I'm sorry, in Christ through the gospel of which I was made a minister according to the gift of God's grace. So through the gospel, you believe and then you're in Christ and you become a partaker. Just look at those verses. It's amazing. So now it's available to everyone. Um, I hope that helps explain how I see Ephesians 1 now. Uh, I will admit shamefully that before I went on this journey, Ephesians 1 only meant one thing to me, verse 4. That's just the ugly truth. That's my fault, not anybody else's. Romans 9, the only verses that meant anything to me in Romans 9 before I went on this journey was Esau I loved, I'm sorry, Jacob I loved, Esau I hated, um, I'll have mercy on whom I have mercy, uh, how dare you ask God questions, that one, uh, Pharaoh's heart and vessels of wrath and vessels of mercy. 
And that's it. That's all I knew about Romans 9. If you can relate to that, then maybe you need to read the whole chapter because there's a lot more there than that. And I gotta say, Romans 9 is packed with cross-references. So Romans 1 through 8, I love Romans. What I discovered on my own study in Romans is just like this incredible laying out of every question you have. <laughs> it's like the beginning, God made it clear through his creation, he is real and there's no excuse, he exists. And people respond differently to that. Either they know it's true and they strive to live in righteousness or they know it's true and they suppress it so that they don't have to bow down to it. And that's the unbelief and the unrighteous, right? Then in chapter two, it breaks down everyone's guilty. Uh, oh no, part, chapter two breaks down that God is not impartial. He will judge you according to what you know. He renders to each one according to his deeds. Even non-believers, Gentiles, that have no idea what the law is, they do the law instinctively because it's written on their hearts. This proves that they have the law in their heart and they have a conscience and they follow it. And then the Jews that do have the law, they will be judged by that because they have the law. So even if you don't have the law, you know what's right and wrong. God will judge them by that. And if you do have the law, you know the law, so God will judge them by that. He's fair, he's just. So it talks about that. Then it talks about how Abraham or all the world is guilty and then how we are justified by faith and Abraham is the perfect amazing example of that that he was credited as faith uh, as he was credited righteousness because of his faith and this is huge right here uh, Abraham believed God and it was credited to him as righteousness there are plenty of passages here in verse in chapter 4 of Romans that prove that faith is not a work this is one of the things that Calvinists believe that faith is a work, like you're doing something. Believing is actually doing something, and so they're categorizing faith as a work, but I think Romans 4 clearly separates works and faith. So it talks about in chapter 3, verse uh, 23 and 24, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, being justified as a gift by his grace through the redemption which is in Christ Jesus. So I think the gift is the justification, the salvation. It's by, because of God's grace, he is going to give us the free gift of justification. And the way we receive that gift is by believing, by having faith. And then in chapter four, it says, for if Abraham was justified by works, he has something to boast about, but not before God. For what does the scripture say? Abraham believed God and it was credited to him as righteousness. Now the one who works, his wage, his payment, right, is not credited as a favor, but as what is due to him. If I go to work and I get paid, you're not giving me a favor. You owe me that money because I worked and it's due to me. Very different than faith. So chapter four, verse three and four and five, huge okay faith and works are different so it says now the one okay now verse five but to the one who does not work does not work but believes in him who is who justifies the ungodly his faith is credited as righteousness so it's totally two different things if you work your wages are due to you if you don't work but believe then it's credited to you as righteousness. Please, just scripture, you guys. I know that we want to be so lowly before the Lord and be so humble before the Lord by saying, even my belief is from you, God. I can't even believe. But really, you're just like, that. the Bible doesn't tell you that. So you don't have to go there. Okay, so anyway, moving on. That's how you get saved. And then Romans 5 uh results of justification talking about sin believers are dead to sin alive in christ now we gotta live for jesus and seven be united to jesus but we understand you're in the flesh and it's gonna be a war till the day you die and you're out of this horrible flesh can't wait to die and be out of this flesh that makes us sin because our spirit is willing but our flesh is weak and then eight we will be delivered from this bondage because we will be glorified one day and then that's pretty much just like it's over. That's everything. And now the lingering question, what about Israel, right? Romans one through eight, 
Paul gave us everything. Well, what about Israel? What about Israel? God's special chosen people. What about them? And Paul takes Romans 9, 10, and 11 to answer that question. He takes these three chapters, which were not chapters in the original letter, to answer that obvious question that somebody's asking, okay? And I'm just going to read it. I'm telling you the truth in Christ. I am not lying. My conscience testifies with me in the Holy Spirit that I have great sorrow and unceasing grief in my heart. For I could wish that I myself were accursed, separated from Christ for the sake of my brethren, my kinsmen, according to the flesh. So his brethren, according to the flesh, are Israel, right? Who are the Israelites? To whom belongs the adoption as sons? What belongs to the Israelites? The adoption as sons and the glory and the covenants and the giving of the law and the temple service and the promises that's all belongs to the israels to the israelites god's chosen people who whose are the fathers and from whom is the christ according to the flesh who is over all god blessed forever amen so also the fathers right all the patriarchs they belong to israel and from whom those fathers came Christ. The lineage of Christ, the Messiah, is from them. And he is sorrowful, even willing to cut himself off from Christ for them. Why? Because they have been stubborn, rebellious, disobedient, and God has gone to another people. But, verse 6, it is not as though the word of God has failed, for they are not all Israel who are descended from Israel, nor are they all children because they are Abraham's descendants, right? Not every Israelite believes in God. Look at the Old Testament, oh my word. Nor are they all children because they are Abraham's descendants, right? Just because you're an Israelite doesn't mean, oh, you're automatically saved. But through Isaac, your descendants will be named. That is, it is not the children of the flesh who are the children of God, but the children of the promise that are regarded descendants. So that reminded me of Galatians 4.4, where Paul makes kind of the same parallel. He's talking about Hagar and Ishmael and their lineage, and he's talking about Sarah and Isaac and that lineage, and that's the promise, and this is the flesh. So we're part of the promise, or the Israelites, the Messiah came from the lineage of the promise, right? Jesus came from the promise, not from Abraham going and doing whatever he thought he took into his own hands to be with Hagar and Ishmael was born. Um, those are children of the flesh. Children of the promise are what God said to do. Sarah will have a baby and call him Isaac. For this is the word of promise. Verse 9. At this time I will come and Sarah shall have a son. And not only this, but there was Rebekah also when she had conceived twins by one man, our father Isaac. So Abraham and Sarah had Isaac, and now Isaac and Rebekah have twins. And while they were still in Rebekah's womb, verse 11, for though the twins were not yet born and had not done anything good or bad, so that God's purpose, according to his choice, would stand, not because of works, but because of him who calls, it was said to her, the older will serve the younger. Okay, so God chose to use Jacob, Israel, if you read Genesis, Jacob is Israel, two nations are in your womb. Cross references. It says two nations are in your womb and the older will serve the younger. What are those nations? If you read Genesis, Jacob is renamed Israel. He is the father of the 12 tribes of Israel. Through him, Jesus the Messiah came. Esau is, the fa is Edom, if you read Genesis, it calls him Edom over and over and over. Now, the difference between them is Jacob's name was literally changed to Israel. Ed, uh, Esau's name was not literally changed by God to Edom, but he is referred to as Edom five times in Genesis. You've got to go check and you've got to check the cross references. So we're talking about two nations here, Jacob, Ed, Esau, that's Israel and Edom, okay? Two nations are in your womb, the older will serve the younger. And then in verse 13, it says, just as it is written, Jacob I loved, but Esau I hated. That is from Malachi. And that's God. In fact, it's like the first chapter, the first or second verse in Malachi. The last book of the New Testament 
hundreds if not thousands of years after Jacob and Esau were long gone, right? And what is happening in Malachi chapter 1, it says, The oracle of the word of the Lord to Israel through Malachi. I have loved you, says the Lord. Who? To Israel. So, I have loved you, Israel, God is saying. But you say, how have you loved us? So, Israel answers back, how have you loved us, Lord? And God answers back, was not Esau Jacob's brother, declares the Lord? Yet, I have loved Jacob, but I have hated Esau, and I have made his mountains a desolation and appointed his inheritance for the jackals of the wilderness. He is talking about two nations. He is talking about, I have loved you, Jacob. I have loved you, Israel, right? I chose you, Israel. Not I hate Esau the individual, but I did not choose Edom. I chose Israel for what? To bring the Messiah through. That's what he chose Jacob for, to be Israel, his special chosen people. This has nothing to do with individual election. This is still having to do with Israel. And then going on, oh, and just on a side note here, Jesus says, you must hate your father, hate your mother, hate your brother and sister to follow me. Does God, does Jesus mean that? And then he says, love everybody and love your enemies. You must hate your parents and your siblings to follow me. Of course not. What is he talking about? What does that even mean? It means you must choose me over everything else. Choose me over your parents and your siblings. Choose me over everything. So Jacob was chosen. Esau was not chosen. For what? The lineage of the Messiah. So moving on to verse 14. What shall we say then? There is no injustice with God, is there? May it never be. Well, why would they be thinking there's injustice? Well, maybe because the younger is going to, uh, the older is going to serve the younger, which is totally contrary to how things would have been back then. And people would be like, what? That's not fair. Why would the older have to serve the younger? The older is the one that deserves the birthright and the younger should serve the older. Well, God said it was going to be this way. So, nope, that's the way it's going to be. And so, no, there's no injustice with God. That, that might be what their question was about. I don't know for sure, but that's how I take it. Verse 15, for he says to Moses, I will have mercy on whom I have mercy and I will have compassion on whom I have compassion. So in other words, if I want to show mercy and compassion, I will because I feel like it because I'm God. I could do that if I want to. And where is he quoting that from? Well, he's if you go and do the cross-reference, he is quoting verse 15 from when Moses is pleading with God to please not destroy Israel. Don't destroy Israel. Remember this. Remember your promises. Remember this. Why was he about to destroy them? Because they made the golden calf. So God was about to destroy Israel. And Moses says, a praise, pleads with him, please don't. And God changes his mind. And after he changes his mind, he says, I'll have mercy on whom I have mercy. And I'll have compassion on whom I have compassion. So it's just another quote from a different time over here that he showed compassion and mercy to Israel when they were very well deserving of being destroyed for already falling short of the commandments that Moses was coming to give them, okay? Verse 16, so then it does not depend on the man who wills or on the man who runs, but on God who has mercy. What doesn't depend on the man who wills and the man who runs? How, how he's gonna use Jacob? Yeah, it doesn't. Before they were born, before they had done anything good or bad, God chose to use Jacob. I don't know why. He's God. He can do whatever he wants. He chose to use Jacob. And that's what he did. It had nothing to do with how Jacob ran or willed. It has to do with God having mercy. That's what he wanted to do. He's God. For the scripture says to Pharaoh, for this very purpose, I raised you up to demonstrate my power in you and that my name might be proclaimed throughout the whole earth. So then he has mercy on whom he desires and he hardens whom he desires. You will say then to me, why does he still find fault for who can resist his will? On the contrary, who are you, O man, to answer back to God? The thing molded will not say to the molder, why did you make me like this, will it? Pharaoh, ah. first of all, why did he raise up Pharaoh? to demonstrate my power in you and that my name might be proclaimed throughout the whole earth. 
How was his name proclaimed throughout the earth? How did he demonstrate his power in Pharaoh? By doing unbelievable wonders in Egypt, right? And protecting the Israelites from those horrifying plagues when they were right next door. That is how God demonstrated his power throughout the whole world. So when you go and you read Exodus, the whole story, you will see that God tells Moses before he even goes to speak to, to Pharaoh, I am going to harden his heart. That's God's plan. But when he goes to speak to Pharaoh for the first time, Moses, Pharaoh hardens his own heart. And then the second time, Pharaoh's heart is hard. And then the third time, Pharaoh hardens his own heart. And then the fourth time, Pharaoh hardens his own heart. And then later on, I don't know which time, God hardens Pharaoh's heart. And then Pharaoh hardens his own heart or his heart is hard. And then later, the last three plagues, God hardens Pharaoh's heart. So first question to think about, if this hardening has to do with being damned to hell before you're even born, because God hardens whoever he feels like it, then why did he have to harden his heart five times? Why didn't he just harden it one time? And why did Pharaoh keep hardening his own heart? Doesn't it make a lot more sense that God knew Pharaoh was a stubborn man and so he used him for his purposes and to make sure that he fulfilled his purposes, he hardened his heart a few more times just to ensure his purposes would be completed, which was to free his people Israel and to show his wonders throughout the whole world? I think so. And God can do whatever he wants. For the next thing is, how, how you'll say to me, why does he still find fault for who can resist his will? On the contrary, who are you, oh man, to answer back? God can do whatever he wants. He saw a stubborn man and he used him to fulfill his purposes. Does that mean Pharaoh was unredeemable? I don't think so. And I don't think there's any reason that we are given to think that or to conclude that. So that's how I see it. I don't see this as having anything to do with damnation or salvation. So far for anybody, we've only talked about Israel so far. And then Pharaoh is used as an example of God hardening uh, hearts. And then... On the contrary, who are you to answer back, right? Verse 21, or does not the potter have a right over the clay to make from the same lump, the same lump, one vessel for honorable use and another for common use? So there's other mentions of potters in the scriptures. Check out Jeremiah 18. Check out 2 Timothy 2. There's no potter mentioned there, but there are earthen vessels mentioned there, which are able to cleanse themselves and to obey, to turn from their evil and to obey. And God can reshape you and reform you into something for mercy if you cleanse yourselves from your wickedness and turn from your evil ways. Um, Jeremiah 18, 2 Timothy chapter 2. And then here, God can use or can make from the same lump one vessel for honorable use and another for common use. Verse 22, what if God, although he, although willing to demonstrate his wrath and to make his power known, although he was doing, he was willing to do that. What if God, although he was willing to demonstrate his wrath and to make his power known, instead he endured with much patience vessels of wrath prepared for destruction. Who are those vessels of wrath? Who, who was prepared for destruction? Well, I think Israel. Israel's in big trouble with God because they have been rebellious and disobedient. They have been rebellious and disobedient. Everybody's asking, well, what about Israel? What about Israel? Because they are the covenant holders and the law, they've received the law, they have the promises. Israel, Jesus came through them. What about them? Well, they were prepared for destruction many a time and God answered Moses and Aaron's prayer many times and instead of destroying them endured with much patience and he verse 23 and why why did he endure with much patience and he did so to make known the riches of his glory upon vessels of mercy which he prepared beforehand for glory so he's not talking about you and me yet He's about to in verse 24. Who are those vessels of mercy prepared beforehand for glory? Israel. <laughs> it's still Israel, you guys. Stop putting yourself in every verse that seems like it might be about you. This is talking about Israel. 
Israel will be given the riches of his glory on those vessels of mercy which he prepared beforehand. And then now here we come in. Now here we come in in verse 24. Even us, even us, whom he also called, not from among the Jews only, but also from among the Gentiles. He was talking about Israel until right now. Right now, verse 23, Israel's everything. Now we're in the picture, the saved Gentiles, even us. Now we can be to make known the riches of his glory. We can be vessels of mercy now. Even us whom he also called, not from among the Jews only, but also from among Gentiles. And now he quotes Hosea, more cross references. I will call those who were not my people, Gentiles, my people. And her who was not beloved, beloved. And it shall be that in the place where it was said to them, you are not my people, there they shall be called sons of the living God. We are officially part of chapter nine now. Verse 27, more cross references. Wow, Isaiah, or I should say Old Testament quotes, not cross references, Old Testament quotes, but go check them out. Go check these out in their context. Verse 27, Isaiah cries out concerning Israel. Though the number of the sons of Israel be like the sand of the sea, it is the remnant that will be saved. For the Lord will execute his word on the earth thoroughly and quickly. And just as Isaiah foretold, unless the Lord of Sabbath, Sabbath had left us to posterity, we would have become like Sodom and we would have resembled Gomorrah. That's how rebellious and disobedient and unbelieving Israel has been. There is only a remnant that will be saved. And it's really sad because they were the, the sons of adoption and glory and covenants and giving of the law and the temple and the promises and the forefathers and the lineage of the Messiah. It's really sad. Verse 30, what shall we say then? Oh, another question. What shall we say then? And then here's the answer. That Gentiles who did not pursue righteousness attained righteousness, even the righteousness which is by faith. But Israel pursuing a law of righteousness did not arrive at that law. Why? Because they did not pursue it by faith, but as though it were by works. They stumbled over the stumbling stone just as it is written. Behold, I lay in Zion a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense, and he who believes in him will not be disappointed. So the stumbling stone is Jesus. Israel stumbled over that rock of offense and were trying to pursue righteousness by the law, by works, but Gentiles have now been, can now attain righteousness by faith. And it continues to talk in verse, in chapter 10, about who can be saved, everyone. And it continues to talk about the Israelites. And then it continues to talk about the Israelites in chapter 11, some more. And it's really long. And it shows me that something else I was taught is replacement theology, which teaches that the church replaces Israel. I think Romans 11 makes it very clear that God still has a plan for Israel and we are grafted in to the original tree. We are not the original tree. They are the root. We are the branches. They hold us up. So we're grafted in and if they were broken off, we can be broken off too. So we better respect God's chosen holy people. Yes, we're grafted in and now we become chosen. And this is the, this is the big thing. I used to believe I was chosen before the foundation of the world. And so then for sure, when I heard the gospel, I believed. Now I believe we're all born the same with all the same capacity to hear the good news and be changed, saved by the power of God upon hearing the good news, believing in your heart, confessing with your mouth. And then once you're saved, you're grafted in. Israel is the elect. They are the elect, right? we're grafted in and then we become elect too. So now it's flip-flop. I used to think you're chosen, so you believe. 
Now I think you believe and become chosen. You become elect because you get grafted into the elect. I hope that makes sense. It's kind of like a team. <laughs> You're part of the team now. You weren't part of the team until you joined the team. Where I used to think that God chose only to save a few, now I think that God chose to use a few in order to save everybody else. God chose to use Abraham to bless all the nations of the world. God chose to use Israel to bless all the nations of the world. God chose to use the apostles to spread the good gospel, the good news to everybody. And now once you believe you are chosen, you are elect, you become part of the chosen and now you can continue to share the good news so that others can become chosen and elect as well. So that's what I think of Ephesians 1 and Romans 9 now and I'm going to put scripture in the description box for you guys regarding limited atonement because I do think it is absolutely absolutely is necessary for you to visit every single passage that talks about what God did who he died for and as much as I dislike election the teaching of election I am I, I fear the teaching of limited atonement. To me, it is scary because there are, and this is just what I've written down. I'm sure there's more, but one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, This is 29 scripture references that say that Jesus either died for the world the whole world, everyone, all people, all mankind, all. And this is 29 verses, okay? The Calvinist has to redefine world, whole world, all, mankind, whosoever, everyone, all people, all, in all of these verses. In 29 Bible verses, they have to redefine words to make limited atonement work. I think that's alarming and should be a very big red flag and cause for concern. I know that there's two verses that say Jesus died for many. And that's the only two verses that I ever hear from people that want to defend limited atonement. But there's also a verse in Romans 5 that says that only many died when Adam died. Let me see. So obviously you can't just isolate a verse and say this is what it means. In Romans 5, it says in verse 15, But the free gift is not like the transgression. For if by the transgression of the one, if by the transgression of Adam, the many died, much more did the grace of God and the gift by the grace of the one man, Jesus Christ, abound to the many. So, if we want to say that Jesus only died for many, well then we can also say that the transgression of Adam only m many died, not all. No, of course not. If you go on to read, then it clarifies and it says all died. And then it also says that all are saved by Jesus. Not all are born again, but yes, all are saved because he's the savior of the world. And I believe that. It, sa it says he's the savior of the world, especially of believers. Simply that means he is the savior of the world he came to the world and he died for the world to save the world but only those who believe are saved from death so he's the savior of the world and especially of believers because they are saved from death but they but the savior of the world everyone is able to be saved from death if they believe so he's especially the savior of believers but he's the savior of the world he tasted death for all mankind and then the other thing that's hugely important is in 1 Corinthians 15, which I actually was reading this morning. Limited atonement puts tons of emphasis on the atonement of Jesus, um, on who did he atone for? Only for the elect. He only died for the elect. He only atoned for the sins of the elect. Okay. His death is part of the atonement. His death is part of salvation. But without his resurrection, nobody can be saved. And that's what 1 Corinthians 15 talks about. It says, um, starting in verse 13, But if there is no resurrection of the dead, not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, then our preaching is in vain. Your faith also is in vain. 
You're like wasting your life if Jesus didn't raise from the dead. Moreover, we are even found to be false witnesses of God because we testified against God that he was raised or that he raised Christ, whom he did not raise. If the fact, if in fact the dead are not raised. Verse 16, for if the dead are not raised, not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is worthless. You are still in your sins. Why? Why such the emphasis on raising from the dead? Because that's what Jesus came to do. He was forgiving sins before he died, right? Raising from the dead, death not being able to hold him, like it says in Acts 2, Jesus died. He became sin for us. He died. He was in the same exact flesh as us, but he did not sin. That's why death was not able to hold him because he was sinless. He was perfect. We are held by death because we are not perfect. We cannot resurrect unless we believe in him who is the first fruits who resurrects and because we believe in him then our his righteousness is imputed to us and we're able to raise from the dead as well and not be held by death because we become righteous as he is righteous by believing in him so there is this emphasis on sin which of course sin 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 the wages of sin is death you die because of sin jesus became sin and died but he didn't pay the wages of death, right? He's alive now. Death couldn't hold him. He didn't stay dead. He resurrected. He defeated death. That's what he came to do. Only he can defeat death. Only he could not stay dead because he is blameless. It's the sin that keeps you dead. So when you die in your sins, that's when you stay dead. If you die believing in Jesus, his righteousness has been imputed to you. And since he rose, you will rise. Death will not hold you either. And without his resurrection, our faith is worthless. We're still in our sins because if death hasn't been defeated, then everybody's just going to stay dead. He needed to defeat death. He needed to rise again. That's the salvation piece right there. So then those also who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. So then everybody before Jesus came and rose from the dead, they've perished then. Those who have died before, they're dead and they're going to stay dead. They're not going to rise again because Jesus' resurrection was their hope too from the Old Testament, right? David says, you, have, you will not abandon my, sh my soul to Sheol. If we have hoped in Christ in this life only, we are of all men the most to be pitied. If we're only going to worship God in this life and live godly, holy lives, but then we die and stay dead, then we are the most pitiful people, right? But if Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who are asleep. For since by a man came death, by a man also came the resurrection of the dead. Da -da 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 -da. For as in Adam we all die, so also in Christ we all will be made alive. So, there's so much more I could say. I've always been taught, like, you have to look at the whole council of scripture. Well, yes, I agree. But on this side of things, I actually realize that when I was a Calvinist, I was not looking at the whole council of scripture. I was only looking at the verses that worked for my doctrine. Now, seeing the whole council of scripture, I realize, oh, there's so much <laughs> that actually you have to look at to form your conclusions. Because if you only look at Ephesians 1, 4, you can make a whole doctrine out of that. Sure, that supports the you, right? Uncon unconditional election. Um, if you only look at Romans 9 and you're told how to interpret it, then yeah, you can totally walk away with, wow, we're elect before the foundation of the world, either to be damned or to be saved as vessels of wrath or mercy. Sure, but when you realize the context of the book and you keep reading Romans 10 and 11 and you see the context, it, everything changes, everything changes. And then when you think about Galatians 4 and you do all the cross references and you check all the cross references and why Paul's even bringing them up in Romans 9, everything comes to light, everything changes. And it's a very valid question for the Romans to have, for Paul to have been anticipating the question from the Romans, what about Israel? Everyone knows Israel's God's people. What about Israel? Of course he's anticipating that question and he's got to answer it to hear about Israel. Bam, 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 bam. I hope this video has helped you understand where uh, my thoughts have changed with certain passages. Of course, there's so, 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 so much to talk about and could be discussed. And it's just impossible this in this version of communication. So feel free to leave comments in the comment section. Feel free to dialogue. I don't know how much I can dialogue. Probably not much. 
but I so appreciate just the loving atmosphere of people dialoguing and helping each other and pointing each other to the scriptures and just supporting one another. We're all on our journey, right? Seeking the Father. And I hope and pray that you all are encouraged and blessed. And I just thank you again for being here and supporting me and come in and listen. God bless you all. See you next time.